Well, good evening and welcome everyone. Welcome to the Sandwich Public Library and this virtual program. My name is Matthew Jones and I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library. So thanks for giving your evening to spending some time with us. We're really looking forward to uh, learning and enjoying some time uh, thinking about reading out loud. Uh, tonight we have a special guest presenter, Julie Hoffman, and we are so thankful that you're here, Julie, and looking forward to learning from you and enjoying what you have to share with us. Um, I'll let everyone know that there is the chat uh, function and Q&A function, so you should see that down at the bottom. Some of you have already found your way there, and um, if you want to uh, say hello and tell us how many of you uh, there are viewing from your screen, that would be great. And you can let us know um, where you're at, where you're viewing from as well. So if you just drop in the chat uh, how many are viewing and where you're from, that'd be great. Um, there's also a Q&A box and you can use the chat or the Q&A to drop your questions for Julie at the end of uh, her presentation. I'll uh, read some of those questions to uh, the group and she will respond to those. So if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the Q&A box or the chat box and I'll share those um, at the end. Um, without, with all of that out of the way, uh, Julie, welcome. Thank you for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I want to make sure that, so Matthew, I'm going to ask if you will check the chat. I want to ask, are you able to see my slides and me at the same time? Because I will be doing some read alouds where I want to show the books, but I also want you to be able to see the slides. Yeah, so go ahead and drop in the chat if you can, if you can see both. All right, so far it seems like the answer is yes. All Excellent. Right. Cool. You're not able to see Julie and the screen. Um, let us know. Uh, otherwise, it looks like we are we're good to go. Cool. Okay. So when I was first asked to put a title on this, I decided to call it "The Power of Story: Reading Aloud Toward Connection, Empathy, and Joy." But as I was putting together the presentation, I decided to go in backwards order because I feel like we need to start with joy first, always with everything. So um, in that spirit, I'm going to start with a Shel Silverstein poem called Invitation. If you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, a magic bean buyer. If you're a pretender, come sit by my fire for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in, come in. So moving along with the joy, I just have to share this book that is called I Am Every Good Thing. It's by Derek Barnes and the illustrations are by Gordon C. James. And I love this book. I love this book so much that I knew about it before it was available in, at bookstores. And I pre-ordered it because I got to hear Derek Barnes and Gordon James talking about their collaborative effort to put this book together. Plus there's a book called Crown Ode to the Fresh Cut that they had written before. So I was already familiar, but I think that this book um, represents all things joy. And anyways, when, when it was available in bookstores, uh, the same day that it came out, it was on my doorstep because I had pre-ordered it. And I think since from that day up until this moment, I've probably read it 998 times. So you get to experience 999. This is I am every good thing. I am a nonstop ball of energy, powerful and full of light. I am a go getter, a difference maker, a leader. I am every good thing that makes the world go round, you know, like gravity or the glow of moonbeams over a field of brand new snow. I'm good to the core, like the center of a cinnamon roll. Yeah, that good. I am skateboard tricks, scraped knees and elbows, but you know what? I'm right back on my feet again. I am 
one eye open, one eye closed, peeking through a microscope, gazing through a telescope, checking out the spaces around me, and plotting out those far off places I have yet to go, but will. Look at these illustrations. I hope you can see them. I am a gentleman and a scholar. I am kind of po and polite like, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, helping my grandmother cross the street and saying, bless you when a stranger has to sneeze. I'm a cool breeze, a perfect paper airplane that glides for blocks, for miles, forever. And yes, it does say cool on there. I am a roaring flame of creativity. I am a lightning round of questions and a star-filled sky of solutions. I am an explorer planting a flag on every square foot of this planet where I belong. I am a sponge soaking up information, knowledge, and wisdom. I want it all, and I am all ears. Okay, this whole entire illustration brings me joy. I love it so much. I love this so much that I want it in like full size to hang on my wall. I am Saturday mornings in the summertime. I am two bounces and a front flip off the diving board. I am hilarious. I am the life of the party. I am that smile forming on your face right now. I'm the boom bop, boom, boom bop. When the bass line thumps and the kick drum jumps, I'm the perfect beat, the perfect rhyme, keeping everything on point and always on time. But you already knew that. I'm a grand slam, bases fully loaded. I'm a nasty two-handed dunk holding onto the rim just to remind you that I'm still the man, believe that. I am the undisputed champion. I'm the highlight reel of magnificence. I am the celebration, the applause, and the standing ovation. I am victory. I am a brother, a son, a nephew, a favorite cousin, a grandson. I am a friend. I am real. I am tight hugs, a hand to hold, a shoulder to cry on if you have to. I hope you never have to. I am here. Although I am something like a superhero, every now and then, I'm afraid. I am not what they might call me, and I will not answer to any name that is not my own. I am what I say I am. I am that sound in the forest when the mighty tree falls. I am waves crashing gently on the shore. I am a force of nature, a miracle, a blessing. I am brave. I am hope. I am my ancestors' wildest dream. I am worthy of success, of respect, of safety, of kindness, of happiness. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am worthy to be loved. I am worthy to be loved. So I think it's important that we start with joy for any reader because like Jim Treleese, who is one of the read aloud gurus that I'm aware of, um, he says, we must take care that children's early encounters with reading are painless enough so that they will cheerfully return to the experience now and forever. But if it's repeatedly painful, we will end up creating a, a school time reader instead of a lifetime reader. So thinking about how from birth on, when we make reading about joy, it's something that we will return to with joy. When we make reading a task, it changes everything. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about reading, read alouds for children at first. And that's kind of based on how words are really, they really are the least expensive gift we can give 
to our kids. Words have power, words have meaning. And if you think about it, for the first year of a child's life, they hear all kinds of words around them. And it takes a whole year before they start to be able to try to use some of them on their own. So around one is when those little syllables or the one syllable words start to come out and eventually become two word sentences. And sometimes those two word sentences even can have um, different meanings. So like dad go means dad's going to work now and I have to wave bye even though I hate that he's going. And then dad go means where did dad go? Is he upstairs? So um, taking that kind of a vocabulary and then building on it is, some, is something that books play a part in. And obviously a one-year-old and a two-year-old is not reading yet because it's usually closer to somewhere between three and six when that magic happens. But all of that time before hearing stories, being read to, being part of conversations adds to their vocabulary. And um, I just grabbed this graphic because it's kind of great. So this shows the number of rare words that we come across in conversations through listening or through reading. So the green represents listening, where the red represents through books or reading, whether it's a read aloud or reading independently. So obviously like an adult to child conversation has fewer rare words than an adult to adult conversation. Sometimes when I'm talking with friends or colleagues, I'll hear something new and I'm like, hold on, what was that word? Or even, oh, that's how you pronounce it. But when we look in the red, those are all texts. And so it's interesting to see that we come across more rare words through reading, whether it's being, whether it's a read aloud or reading to ourselves, we come across more new vocabulary than we do in conversation. I also love this graphic because if you look really closely, you'll see that magazines and comic books have more rare words than regular adult novels or, or books for grownups. Um, I think that there are probably kids now who play video games that would even say that they come across new words and expand their vocabulary in that microcosm as well. Um, but this was done a while ago. So it would be interesting to go back and grab more data on that. So we talked kind of a little bit about some of the benefits of reading aloud to kids. And then the question becomes like, so when should we stop reading out loud to people? Is there a certain age when you should stop reading to your child? And I, um, I know it probably looks weird to have my answer to the question to be um, several logos, but I want you to think about this for a second. We have Target up here and Starbucks and McDonald's. And if you partake in any of those places, it's because you have decided that you really like it. If Target is your place for shopping, you know that you like to go to Target and probably will again. Or Starbucks, if you like Starbucks, you know where it is in relation to your house, probably even how many minutes of driving time it takes to get there. But here's the thing, even though they have already captured the wallets of millions of people all over the country, they still advertise. They advertise on their cups. They advertise by sending you emails. McDonald's, even with billions served, still put money into commercials. I think there was probably even a commercial during the Super Bowl for McDonald's, even though everybody already knows what it is. So why do they spend time and money putting together advertisements? Because we're, we're busy people and we need reminders of stuff that we like. And every time that um, somebody who enjoys McDonald's fries with a, the salty goodness um, sees those golden arches or hears a commercial or gets the little, like the newest song stuck in your head, there is a little bit of like, oh yeah, I like those. Maybe I should go get some. And I think that read alouds are along the same lines. We should never ever stop reading aloud to anyone at any age because reading good books or poetry or newspaper articles or whatever you have in your hands, reading that 
to people is a way of connecting and it's a way um, to remind us, oh yeah, I like reading, I like those books. Maybe I should get into one myself. And I think this kind of goes along with when you hear people talk about that, um, you can lead a horse to water kind of thing. Yes, of course we can lead someone to water, but I think that is also our responsibility to demonstrate that the water is safe and that the water is cool and ref refreshing and delicious. And read alouds do that with books. So how do we advertise a book? Sometimes it's great to read a whole entire book with someone or with a group of someone's, but sometimes it is just about advertising a book and getting someone interested in it. And one way you can do that is just by reading the first page. So from the very first Harry Potter book of the series by JK Rowling, here's page one. The Boy Who Lived. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. And that is page one in its entirety. I mean, like who, who doesn't want to keep going or flip to the next page to read that? Sometimes we can advertise a book by reading the first chapter or two or the beginning of a book. So this is House Arrest by K.A. Holt. A little background, it's written as a novel in verse. So it's like poetry. It's also in the format of a journal. So the boy who is writing in his journal is writing kind of poetry style as well. <clears throat> it starts like this, winter. Week one, boys don't write in journals unless it's court ordered. At least this is what I've figured. I, I have, I have nothing to say. Oh, I'm not allowed to say, I'm not allowed to have nothing to say except on Tuesdays when I go to Mrs. Bainbridge who calls me Tim instead of Timothy. I sit on her squishy couch, my mouth sealed shut, my eyes burning holes in the leaves of all of her plants. She says I can call her Maureen, but who would wanna be called Maureen? Adjudicated, delinquent. I had to look up how to spell that three times. I don't feel like a delinquent and I don't know what adjudicated means even after looking it up. Sounds like a kung fu move. I adjudicated you in your face. Hia! A whole year of this journal? Maybe I'll write about the other people I see, like Jose just being Jose. I will pretend his life is mine like I can still go hang out in our street whenever I want. Magnolia Circle, where I've always lived with the manhole cover that makes a perfect third base. Week two, how do you let yourself, or how, do you, how do you let yourself become a probation officer? Is there a school for that? A diploma? Congrats, James, you have graduated and you are now a complete tool. Uh, James recommends not writing any more things like that last thing. Otherwise, the judge will get mad. Who knew my probation officer could read my journal? I would like it on record that that is not fair. Do you hear me, James? Do you hear me, Mrs. Bainbridge? Do you hear me, judge? A personal journal is very crowded with so many eyes. 
James on Monday, Mrs. Bainbridge on Tuesday, school every day, home every day, nowhere else unless mom is with me. That's the schedule journal, got it? It's pretty simple, like a court ordered cage with a mom shaped lock. You better take this journal seriously, James told me Monday, or they'll throw you in juvie so fast your head will spin. As if my head isn't already spinning. On that day weeks ago, I'd lost my head. Everything foggy and frosty, everything a dwarf name from a fairy tale that doesn't exist. I remember I was so tired. So, so, so tired. Levi had been sick the night before. One of those nights with a nurse at home to help. Mom had had her hands full and I did too. Levi was sick, so I helped, running for towels, for meds, for the heavy oxygen tank, for the suction machines, for the spare trach tubes, for the ties to keep the tube in his neck so he could breathe, which he wasn't doing very well that night. Before the morning, when my head was full of fairy tale dwarves named Foggy and Frosty and Sleepy and Crazy. I will never know what I was thinking when I stole that wallet, because I wasn't thinking, I wish everyone would stop asking. There is no what when there is no thinking, there is just is-ing. Things happen, things happened just like that. Snap, it is what it is. It was what it was, so stop asking. I was trying to help, that's all. But it was the opposite of help, and I know that now. I'm not sorry though, if you're wondering. I'm just sorry I got caught, because it would have helped. It would have. So that's the beginning of house arrest. And then sometimes instead of reading the beginning of a book, we can read what Stephen Lane calls the sweet spot of a book. It's um, kind of the moment where um, something interesting happens or the, a moment when the story shifts or the telling of one story shifts. So this is um, from Shout, which is a memoir by Lori Hulse Anderson. She wrote a fiction book called Speak about um, a girl who had been assaulted. Um, and Shout, she wrote almost 20 years later. And it's kind of like in response to the Me Too movement. As a matter of fact, it says, the true story of a survivor who refused to be silenced. The interesting thing about this memoir is that it's written as, it's also written in verse, kind of like the book I just showed you. And um, at the beginning, she talks about kind of her childhood and some of the, some of the times where she needed to be quiet about some of the things that happened. And so I'm going to read Shame Turned Inside Out. Sisters of the torn shirts, Sisters of the chase around the desk, casting couch, hotel room, file cabinet. Sisters dragging shattered dreams, bruised hopes, ambitions abandoned in the dirt. Sisters fishing one by one in the lake of shame, hooks baited with fear always come back empty. Truth dawns slow when you've been beaten and lied to, but it burns hard and bright once it wakes. Sisters, drop everything. Walk away from the lake, leaning on each other's shoulders when you need the support. Feel the contractions of another truth ready to be born. Shame turned inside out is rage. And then I also have Drums, Girls, and Dangerous Pie. And this book, I would say, has a lot of sweet spots because Jordan Sonnenblick does a fantastic job going back and forth between, between like painful stuff and humor. So this book, Drums, Girls, and Dangerous Pie, we have main character, Steven, who's in eighth grade. And he um, has a younger brother, Jeffy, who I think is four. And Jeffy has just, um, well, how, how would I say this? Okay, so we're at the part where he does not know what's wrong with Jeffy but there was a morning where Jeffy fell off of a kitchen stool and had like a bloody nose that was beyond the normal amount of blood that should come out of a four-year-old's face. So it resulted in a trip to the emergency room. Um, and 
Stephen, who was the big brother in the kitchen when it happened, is feeling all kinds of guilt about his brother getting hurt. As it ends up, um, when mom gets home with Jeffy from the hospital, Jeffy has also been diagnosed with leukemia. And so Stephen's kind of just sitting with that. And here is um, the morning after that happens. So this is, it's called Jeffrey's vacation. In the morning, I was the first one up as usual. I was really hungry for some odd reason. And I was thinking that Jeffrey was going to have a hard day. So I decided to surprise him with the oatmeal he had never gotten the day before. I got everything all cooked up and had just covered the pot when I heard little footsteps behind me. I started to speak and turn at the same time. Good morning, Jeffy, I made you some. Now, I knew Jeffrey was bruised up from his fall. And I also knew that bruises always look worse on the second day. But at that stage of the game, I didn't know how much worse bruises looked on a kid with leukemia. When I turned around, I gasped and my hand came to my mouth. Jeffrey had the two worst black eyes I'd ever seen and his nose was swollen to about twice its normal size. He saw my reaction and winced. What's wrong, Steven? How does your face feel, Jeffy? It feels thick. Thick and hot, why? It's um a little swollen. What do you mean, do I look funny? What if the new doctor thinks they look stupid? I'm gonna go look in the mirror. Before I could even think of stopping him, he ran to the foyer and looked in our hallway mirror. I ran over and he looked at me with horror in his eyes. Steven, I look like a raccoon. You do not look like a raccoon. Actually, he looked like some deranged anteater, but I didn't figure that would be the thing to tell him. Yes, I do. Oh no, what if I stay this way forever? You're not gonna stay that way forever, Jeffy. People get black eyes all the time. If they never got better, the streets would be crowded with raccoon people. Soon the raccoon people would find each other and breed. I was on a roll here. The preschools would fill up with strange ring-eyed children. Soon the raccoons would be taking over our streets, stealing from our garbage cans, leaving eerie trails of dinty more beef stew cans in their wake. Gangs of them would haunt the malls, buying up all the black and gray striped sportswear. The rivers would rise. The valleys would run with, Stephen, you're joking, right? What's for breakfast? Oatmeal. Yay, moatmeal. And just like that, Jeffrey was over his crisis, which is pretty amazing. If I have a single zit, I wanna crawl under my bed and hide with three days worth of food. This kid looks like he just lost a boxing match with a gorilla and it takes him like five minutes in a bowl of hot cereal to forget about it. While Jeffrey was eating, I snuck upstairs to warn the rents about Jeffrey's looks. I figured my mom was going to have enough shock to deal with, so I should spare her this one if I could. It worked, or at least the rents managed to hide their reactions from Jeffrey when they came downstairs. We all sat at the breakfast table pretending to be normal and cheerful. But you know how when you watch the Brady Bunch, you think, oh, come on, nobody is this happy. What's wrong with you people? And who picks out your clothes? Well, breakfast was sort of like that, only instead of the clothing problem, we had an unmentionable cancer problem. The goodbyes were pretty uneventful and Jeffrey even managed to bug me, which was probably a good sign. On his way out the door, he turned to make fun of his brother. You're going to school. You're going to school. If he had known what was coming up for his day, he would have been begging me to smuggle him to school in my backpack. Okay, so we also talk about how books help us, or, and reading aloud helps us with empathy. Empathy being where, hmm, where we can try to understand where someone is coming from, or some people say even like to be in their shoes, which literally reading is one of the best ways to do that because you can, well, I guess figuratively get into the character's shoes. But instead of me trying to explain it, I'm gonna go with Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop's explanation because she talks about literature as windows and mirrors 
She's also changed it to add on sliding glass doors and even some cultures that have like curtains, but let's just go simple windows and mirrors. So a book that is like a mirror would be a book where we see ourselves. So um, a book where we can relate to the character, whether it's character traits or um, the conflict that the character is dealing with. And sometimes it's not always the main character. It might be one of the other characters that we connect with, but it's really like a where we see ourselves. And that kind of helps with our own identity and helps us to know we're not alone in the world with whatever, whatever it is. And then a window book would be where we get a chance to glimpse into the life of someone else. So it might be a different culture or gender. So like when I'm reading a book from a, a male point of view, there might be things where I'm like, I hadn't really thought about things that way. Um, for me, window books are definitely reading books from other cultures where, um, you know, like there's a book called The Breadwinner where the story takes place in Afghanistan. And as I was reading it, because it was through the perspective of a 12 year old character, I could connect with the character, but then also learned about things going on there. And I don't know that I, that I, I don't know that I would have grasped if I just tried to get it from the news. So anyhow, that would be a window book. And because you know that I love picture books, I'm going to share another one. This is called The Bad Seed. It's written by Jory John and the illustrations are by Pete Oswald. I'm a bad seed, a bad seed. Oh yeah, it's true. The other seeds, they look at me and they say, that seed is so bad. When they think I'm not listening, they mumble, there goes a bad seed. But I can hear them. I have good hearing for a seed. How bad am I? You really wanna know? Well, I never put things back where they belong. I'm late to everything. I tell long jokes with no punchlines. I never wash my hands or my feet. I lie about pointless stuff. I cut in line every time. I stare at everybody. I glare at everybody. I finish everybody's sentences and I never listen. And I do lots of other bad things too. Know why? Because I'm a bad seed, a bad seed. I just can't help it. Sure, I wasn't always this bad. I was born a humble seed on a simple sunflower in an unremarkable field. I had a big family, seeds everywhere. We found ways of having fun. We were close, but then the petals dropped and our flowers drooped. It's kind of a blur. I remember a bag, everything went dark and then then, a giant! I thought I was a goner. I thought I was done for. I screamed and I hollered, ah! But I was spit out at the last possible second. I flew through the air and I landed under the bleachers with a huge thud. When I woke up, it was dark outside. A wad of gum had softened my fall. I felt okay but something had changed in me. I'd become a different seed entirely. I'd become a bad seed, a bad seed. That's right, I stopped smiling. I kept to myself, I drifted. I was friend to nobody and bad to everybody. I was lost on purpose. I lived inside a soda can. I didn't care and it suited me. Until recently, I've made a big decision. Decision. I've decided I don't wanna be a bad seed anymore. I'm ready to be happy. It's hard to be good when you're so used to being bad, but I'm trying. I'm taking it one day at a time. Sure, I still forget to listen and I still show up late. And I still talk during movies and I do all kinds of other bad stuff. But I also say thank you and I say please, and I smile, 
and I hold doors open for people. Not always, but sometimes. And even though I still feel bad sometimes, I also feel kind of good. It's sort of a mix. All I can do is keep trying and keep thinking, maybe I'm not such a bad seed after all. Hey, look, there goes that bad seed. Actually, he's not all that bad anymore. I heard that. Okay, um, I was telling Matthew about this book right before we started. So um, another book that would be kind of a, for some of you, it's probably a window book. For me, it's been a, a big mirror book. But this is The Life I'm In by Sharon Flake. About 20 years ago, she wrote a book called The Skin I'm In, which is amazing. And it was also a window and mirror at the same time book for me. So this book just came out. It's actually like published in 2021. I think it's only been out in the world for about three weeks. Of course, I had to get it immediately and started reading it. And the main character is Char, short for Charlize. She, in the, in the other book, the companion book, she was a bully. She was very, like very, very mean. Um, there was a girl named Malika and she had convinced Malika to start a fire. Like I, Char Charlize barely showed up at school, all of the things. So in this book, it starts off, um, so it's from Charlize's perspective and it starts off where she and her sis her big sister Juju are living together and Juju is at the point where she's like, I can't figure out how to help anymore. Like I need to move on and try to be a grown up. You're still finishing school. So she puts her on a Greyhound bus to go to her grandma and grandpa's. As she's on the bus, um, you know, she's noticing all the other people on this ride, including a mom who like a single parent who has a baby and is struggling. And she even makes the point that like, of course, everybody on this Greyhound bus is probably struggling because if they had money, they would have taken a plane or whatever. So she's just noticing stuff. And at one point she um, is holding the baby so that the mom can go to the bathroom or whatever. And someone comments on how um, they say, you're good with that baby, better than her own mother. People don't say that to me much, that I'm good at something, I mess up, I screw up, I'm too loud, I fight too much, but that don't mean I ain't got feelings or don't want what other people want. Who knows? Maybe I could be a daycare worker or go to school for nursing and be a baby nurse or own my own daycare center. I take out a piece of paper, then write down all the things I already know how to do, like cook and clean, change babies, make them laugh, read to them. Then I make myself a promise. No matter how hard things get, I won't, I won't never give up or give in and, or stop believing I can make somebody like my mom and dad that would be, oh wait, make, can, that I can be somebody my mom and dad would be proud of. I take out my phone and almost call Juju to tell her that. Only I know what she would say. Char, you've been in the seventh grade three years straight. Why don't you put your mind to finishing that first? So anyhow, this is a book that um, I just needed to tell you guys about. That's that's all. So um, last though, I would say that um, read alouds are about connection. And when we talk about connection, I would say that sharing a book together is kind of like a, like a way of sharing a love letter to each other. And I would also say that sharing a book together out loud is a way to express stuff that we might not have the words for. So again, it takes the pressure off to read someone else's words. Um, plus it could just be fun. If you're doing a read aloud like um, Gary Paulson's Harris and Me, you can just you know read and laugh together and, um, and enjoy all of that. The thing about it is that now that we have audiobooks and things like Audible where you can easily, you know, read with your ears, and I'm an advocate for that. I do like, I, I even like reading with my ears. I have books on Audible and sometimes I'll put that on and clean the house or fold laundry or, you know, when I want company. But that is not the same thing 
as a read aloud. When it comes to a read aloud, the person should be you. And I know that I, I pulled this quote from In Defense of Read Aloud, which is by Stephen Lane. And his words talk about never underestimating your own value to your students because nobody can read aloud better than you. Um, but I would say that it's also the same when it's to, to your children, your spouse, your nieces and nephews, your grandchildren. They don't want to hear the recorded narrator on an audiobook if they can hear you. They want to hear you because it is about connecting. I would also say that the books that you choose should be the books that you love. So um, there's nothing worse than sitting through a read aloud of a book where the reader is not invested in it. So read, read stuff where you can picture the imagery and bring that to life. Read where you feel like you um, already know the characters and can give them different voices. Read what you love because that will come through it. I would also, well, here, let me backtrack for a second. I would also say that um, you should read, yeah, just read what you love. I'm also, um, well, here, I'm gonna read one last thing to you guys. Um, and I feel like this is about connection. I know there's a big spider. I'm gonna connect through spiders. Um, the funny thing is that I love this story so much that the book that I'm going to read from you says 15th anniversary edition. And then I have a picture of the 25th anniversary edition. So this has been around for a long time. This is Robert Fulham um, from his book, All I, Need, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And it really is Uncommon Thoughts on Common Things. You might be familiar with his list of things that he learned in kindergarten, but I am going to read one called Spiders. This is my neighbor, nice lady, coming out her front door on her way to work in her looking good mode. She's locking the door now and picking up her daily luggage, purse, lunch bag, gym bag for aerobics and the garbage bucket to take out. She turns, sees me, gives me the big smiling hello, takes three steps across her front porch and goes, ah! that's a direct quote. At about the level of a fire engine at full cry, spider web. She's walked full force into a spider web and the pressing question, of course, just where is the spider now? She flings her baggage in all directions and at the same time does a high kick jitterbug sort of dance like a mating stork in crazed heat. Clutching at her face and hair, she goes ah! at a new level of intensity. Tries opening the front door without unlocking it. Tries again, breaks key in the lock, runs around the house headed for the back door Doppler effect of, ah. Now a different view of this scene. Here is the spider. Rather ordinary, medium gray, middle-aged lady spider. She's been up since before dawn working on her web and all is well. Nice day, no wind, dew point just right to keep things sticky. She's out checking the moorings and thinking about the little gnats she'd like to have for breakfast. Feeling good, ready for action. All of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Earthquake, tornado, volcano. The web is torn loose and is wrapped around a frenzied moving haystack and a huge piece of raw but painted meat is making a sound the spider has never heard. Ah! It's too big to wrap up and eat later and it's moving too much to hold down. Jump for it, hang on and hope, dig in. Human being, the spider has caught a human being and the pressing question is of course, where is it going and what will it do when it gets there? The neighbor lady thinks the spider is about the size of a lobster and has big rubber lips and poisonous fangs. The neighbor lady will probably strip to the skin and take a full shower and shampoo just to make sure it's gone and then put on a whole new outfit to make certain that she's not inhabited. The spider, well, if she survives all this, she will really have something to talk about. The one that got away that was this big and you should have seen the jaws on the thing. 
spiders, amazing creatures. Been around maybe 350 million years so they can cope with just about anything. Lots of them too. 60 or 70,000 per suburban acre. Yeah, it's the web thing that I envy. Imagine what it would be like if people were equipped like spiders. If we had this little six nozzled aperture right at the base of our spine and we could make yards of something like glass fiber with it. Wrapping packages would be a cinch. Mountain climbing would never be the same. Think of the Olympic events and mating and child rearing would take on new dimensions. Well, you take it from there. It boggles the mind. Cleaning up human-sized webs would be a mess on the other hand. But all of this, it reminds me of a song I know, and you know too, and your parents and their children, they know about the itsy bitsy spider. Went up the water spout, down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain and the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. You probably know the motions too. What's the deal here? Why do we all know that song? Why do we keep passing it on to our kids? Especially when it puts spiders in such a favorable light. Nobody goes, ah, when they sing it. Maybe because it puts the life adventure in such clear and simple terms. The small creature is alive and looks for adventure. Here's the drain pipe, a long tunnel going up towards some light. The spider doesn't even think about it, just goes. Disaster befalls it, rain, flood, powerful forces, and the spider is knocked down and out beyond where it started. Does the spider say, forget that? No, the sun comes out, clears things up, dries off the spider, and the small creature goes over to the drain pipe and looks up and thinks it really wants to know what's up there. It's a little wiser now, checks the sky first, looks for better toeholds, says a spider prayer, and heads up through mystery toward the light and wherever. Living things have been doing just that for a long, long time, through every kind of disaster and setback and catastrophe. We are survivors, and we teach our kids about that. And maybe spiders tell their kids about it too in their spider way. So the neighbor lady will survive and be a little wiser coming out the door on her way to work. And the spider, if it lives, will do likewise. And if not, well, there are lots more spiders. And the word gets around, especially when the word is, ah! So I chose that one because I was just thinking about with connection, especially now in 2020 slash 2021, where we hear things about how these times are unprecedented or we're dealing with the unknown. Um, although I don't know if we can really say unprecedented after it's been almost a year. It's, it's pretty precedented now. But I think I wanted to share something that was just about um, survive, surviving and how um, we have this and we have each other and we can say our little spider prayers too and keep, and keep moving along. So that was kind of why I picked that. Um, here's some contact information. I know that three, well, four fifths of you have this info. So that's that. And I'm gonna come back to your beautiful faces, I think. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Julie. That was, that was very, very fun to listen to and, um, and quite meaningful. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, if you have questions, feel free to start dropping those in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and it looks like we have a request for a list of all the books that you shared. So I will definitely uh, compile that and make that available um, along with this recording. And so you can find that on the library's website. I will share that when that gets posted. Um, uh, first question, Julie, is could you share a memory that you have around reading out loud, either being read to or reading out loud? Um, that seems a special memory to you. Yeah, sure too. So when I was in elementary school, um, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Galvin, would read to us 
right after lunch. And I remember it was um, the Beverly Cleary book. So like Ramona the Pest, the Pest and Ramona Quimby age eight and Ramona and Beezus, all of them. I don't remember which one she read, but I remember, I remember coming in and just having, having time to listen to a story where I didn't have to complete another worksheet or, um, and I, I was, I was a, like a good student. I was going to say I was a good kid. That would be a lie, but I was a good student. Um, so school was definitely like refuge for me, but it was very, very nice to have one part of the day where school wasn't about jumping through the hoops or doing the things. And I could just listen to a story and enjoy it. And I love, and that one of the reasons why I can't remember which one she read to us is that I ended up falling in love with those and like reading all of them multiple times. So they're just kind of a big mess in here. But um, another memory that I have, so when I was earning my undergraduate degree to become a teacher, I took a children's literature class and Stephen Lane who wrote the, this one in defense of read aloud read to us on the very first day of class. I think that he read to us every class. And I will say that as a doctoral student, I got to have him again. And even at the doctoral level, he reads to us where he's like, I believe if, if I believe that this is it, then I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. But the book that he read the first day of class for um, undergrad I have up there, it's Lily's Purple Plastic Purse by Kevin Hankus. And um, again, it was, it, I don't know if I have really truly have any window books because I connect with all the characters. But um, in that book, Lily, Lily got in trouble at school and, um, and not knowing that she was still good with her teacher, like that her teacher still cared about her. Um, her response when she got in trouble was way bigger, um, you know, very magnified um, until she was like affirmed at the end. But yeah, so I, I love that book so much. Um, so that would, that would definitely be one of my other memories. That's great. That's great. All right. Any other questions? Another chance to share? Um, one of the things that really fascinated me about what you were sharing was this idea of how we go about advocating for a book. And as you were reading that, I would kind of was working back in my mind of every time that I've read a book that I really found meaningful and my way of advocating for a book was just telling someone, oh, here, you should read it. And I've never thought um, you, you gave, gave a strategy for how to go about sharing a book and drawing people in. And so having those options of reading the first page or the first chapter or a sweet spot, um, I was like, oh, I now feel like I, I can, I can advocate for a book in a way that's going to be more meaningful and they still might not, you know, choose to read it, but at least um, I've done more than just say, here's the title and the author, right? So I appreciated that because I realized, wow, I probably haven't been making a very compelling argument for some of the books that um, I've found to be meaningful. So I appreciated those perspectives as well. Yeah, well, because I think like, Re literacy or reading is is social and I think that a lot of times we picture the reader tucked in a corner with their book not interacting with someone but then when you go to school or work or whatever you can you can throw out the name of a show that's on Netflix and people will like oh I'm on season three episode two I'm at the part where and they'll talk about what they're watching and I think we, we need to do that with books. Like, oh, I'm, I'm at the part where she decided that she was gonna run away and she just started putting stuff in her backpack, um, especially the cookies or, you know. Yeah. Um, and then it's like, ooh, that sounds interesting. What are you reading kind of thing? So yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, oh, a question came in. Um, Though it wouldn't foster connection, any thoughts about reading out loud to oneself? Yes. So um, the research shows that, and this kind of, this goes back to what I was talking about, where we do spoken language before we're reading and writing. So like children hear it, then they speak it, then reading and writing happens. 
And it's the same with us where um, the average human beings listening comprehension is about two grade levels higher than their independent reading comprehension. So with, sorry, I have the hiccups. So like in a classroom to read out loud levels, the playing field, because then all students have access to the same story, right? But even for ourselves, uh, I'll just, uh, when I first started working on my doctorate and I had to read scholarly articles from journals about research, I didn't know what I was reading. And so um, I remember my son was in the room and I'm like, listen to what I have to read. And I started reading it out loud to him. And for him, because he's a genius, he was like, oh, well, what that's explaining is. But for, for me, just the act of reading it out loud as I, as I started to put it to word, I was like, oh, that makes sense. And so, um, and I'll see kids do that sometimes where they're reading and not understanding. And then I'm like, you know, but then they'll read it out loud. And part of that is really the, um, so the sub vocalization is the fancy term for what happens in our head when we hear, um, when we hear what we're reading and when that's not working for us, definitely, um, reading it out loud helps. And so, if it helps with comprehension, I see the question is about fostering connection. I think if it's about connecting with the character too, um, when I was putting together this presentation, let me, let me just say this. When I was reading from House Arrest, the part where he was like, um, let me see if I can find it. I, well, anyways, I was reading it out loud and I got, choked up and it was just me. Um, and I know that some of the people on here know like that's just because you're a crier, Julie. But um, but reading it out loud did, um, it's like there's a visceral connection to it. So yes, reading it out loud even to yourself will bring it to life a lot more. Well, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, thanks for sharing your contact information. So if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to Julie and uh, she'd be happy to hear from you. Um, once again, thank you so much for giving an evening to be with us and to read out loud to us. And I think uh, we definitely uh, felt the joy. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. I um, just want to make everyone aware that um, on Saturday, March 13th, we'll be back for another webinar. We'll be hosting an event called Planning and Planting a Veggie Garden. And we have a master gardener that will be with us and teaching us all about how to get that garden going uh, for this season. So I would invite you to join us back for that program as well. Uh, but again, Julie, thank you so much for your time and uh, for the insights and the stories. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, and really quick, Karen, I see your comment about reading the Harry Potter books and um, definitely flip the page from page one and start with page two, read it or read or reread page one. Excellent. Thank so, you for doing that. Good. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.